I hope if any of you guys ever see me at a Comic Con or you see me in your local comic book store, that you come up and say hey and say what's up and ask me questions and prove that I'm a fake fan by asking me a really obscure piece of trivia that I don't know the answer to. Anyway, we're here, we're back, we're gonna talk comic books. That's what we talk about on this channel, in case you haven't noticed. But I kinda, instead of recommending, instead of like talking about stuff that is the best of the best, which I usually like to do, I wanna talk about stuff that you shouldn't read, or I mean, you can read it. I'm not going to tell you what to read and what not to read, but generally this is not stuff I recommend to people. Some of the more like controversial or weird takes on characters or things like that. Um, and talk about my reasoning for that and why like I wouldn't pitch this as your first exposure to a character. Generally, the very like soap opera nature of comic books means that you can kind of jump in anywhere and you're going to get a decent feel for where the story is and you're going to be able to pick up what's going on within like an issue or two. But there's also stuff that I think if you start with that part of the character, you're going to miss out a lot on like why people like the character. And let's not waste any time. Let's get into the first one. The first one I want to talk about is Batman Nightfall. This is like, you know, an interesting take on the character. Uh, this is the volume one trade paperback. It's really, truly a compendium at this size. It's pretty, it's pretty hefty. And this is just the first volume. I have had so much trouble finding the second volume anywhere. Um, so I only have the first. But this is, you know, it, I, I think that in some ways it's a classic uh, in terms of how well-known it is and how recognizable it is, especially given the fact that it has gone on to a lot of mainstream appeal and uh, recognizability because of the Dark Knight Rises movie and Tom Hardy, you know, breaking Christian Bale's back and the Batman um, scene. And so there's a lot there where like people kind of know what this is, even if they don't know what the comic is that it's based on. But also, you know, with a lot of comic book movies, I think this is the case, but the movie really improves on the source material. I think this is like, an acquired taste. This is something that it takes some time to legitimately really like. I'm not going to do this for all of these books, but I do want to take a little bit of time to defend this here in just a second. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of context on like why this is not the first Batman book to read. So I've talked on this channel before about how my first Batman book ever uh, was Batman 444, which is a very... Uh coincidentally cool number to have as your first issue of Batman. Uh, Marv Wolfman wrote it and I got to meet Marv last year and like it, it's just a cool piece of my life story that Batman was one of the first comic books I owned that I got it as a gift uh, for Christmas from a family member and in that era of Batman it was I, I feel a pretty grounded detective type Batman. Um, you got a lot of stories that happened at street level you, even if you have stuff with the Joker or the Penguin um, you get a lot of things that feel, you know, very realistic and, and very much like uh, espionage and kind of the underworld of Gotham and all that stuff. And I find that stuff really cool. I think that's when Batman's at his best. Like the Justice League is awesome, but also like Batman in space does not hit the same as Batman in like a dark alley at night, right? That's when really the character of Batman is its most potent, I think. And so after that era, after the Marv Wolfman era and after like the Jim Starlin era and some of the eras that have a lot of really grounded kind of interesting gritty stories to them, um, you start to get towards the late 80s and 90s. And as with many beloved characters, you know, Spider-Man, Superman, who we're going to talk about in a little bit here, and a bunch of main stream big comics characters, uh, they start to get really stylized. And so you see a lot of Batman artwork from the 90s that's like hyper stylized and very interesting and unique. Now, I'm most of the time a fan of stylizing cartoon characters, comic characters. I always think that like you can have somebody like a Neil Adams, you can have somebody who respects the very traditional pen work and makes things look very realistic. And that's really cool. And that's its own deal. And if you want it to look like Prince Valiant or something like that's awesome. But then to counterbalance that, you should have times where like we're talking about the, the essence and the movement and the shapes and the abstract ideas of, of a character. And Batman is somebody that, you know, is very um, rife for, with that kind of interpretation. Obviously, all of Frank Miller's work is the perfect example of that. But Batman, I think, does best when he's like a figure and a silhouette. And that's why, as much as it gets hate, I'm a big fan of Todd McFarlane's issue of Batman number 423. I think that's a really cool cover because it's like not realistic and the proportions are odd and it's strange. But it's, it's iconic and, and very... Um, it's got a nice silhouette. I like that. And Nightfall is for many people where they kind of fall off the bandwagon of liking stylized Batman. Um, obviously on the cover here, it's very self-explanatory that Bane is this like disgustingly proportioned, massive, overly human figure. Like it's imp he's impossibly large. Um, and I think to an extent, right, you're comfortable accepting that when it's a book that you're more used to. So no one looks at the Hulk or the Thing or any of those characters and says that they're like, oh, they're like overly stylized. It's like, well, no, they're supposed to be someone who is that big. Um, but Bane here and, and some of the designs, especially of Batman's suit as well, face a lot of these criticisms of being like really aggressively proportioned and having like very 90s features. And I think that 
maybe when that criticism is levied, uh, it, it can be interpreted, not every time, but it can sometimes be interpreted as a way to say that it has too much uh, motion and physicality and emotion and movement and not enough grounded, realistic artwork. And I think that that misses out on a lot of what makes the artwork good here. Um, I will also say, though, that the story is the thing that is okay to criticize, right? I mean, we're talking about the 90s. We're talking about a time where generally writing was not prioritized in comic books. Yes, there are good stories from the 90s, but the reason we talk about good stories written in the 90s is because they are outlawed in a broadly art-focused decade of comic books. So Batman Nightfall, if you've never read Batman before, you've read a little bit and you want to get into it, don't start here. Read it once you have the context of why the character is beloved. Also, I just found a uh, Midtown Comics business card with Moon Knight on it inside this, so I guess I bought this at Midtown Comics, uh, or maybe I bought this at a Comic-Con where Midtown had a booth. That would be my, my best guess. I told you we were going to talk about Superman. This is the death of Superman. So many people worked on this book uh, that I really like and I think are very cool. And it's interesting the place that this book holds in Superman's history. Now, when I say comics you shouldn't read, um, I'm not saying you shouldn't ever read. I'm just saying don't start here. And people like to talk about the death of Superman as like this pivotal moment in comics history because it was unprecedented and it was da 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 I don't think the point that needs to be made there is that, like, it was an unprecedented event. I agree, but I think that's assumed, right? Oh, Superman died. That's a big deal. It's exactly the same as any other, like, really monumental event in comic book history. Gwen Stacy dies. Oh, that's crazy. You know, that's a big moment that they take in the comics. I think what makes this interesting is how late in comics history an unprecedented event happened and the precedent that it set going forward for what an unprecedented event in comics meant. That was a lot of words to say something that I'll now explain much more simply, but I had to grab another book off my shelf to explain what I'm talking about, and that's The Return of Superman. So The Return of Superman is the thing that I think more people have an issue with than they want to acknowledge. Uh, Superman dying, fighting Doomsday, you know, there's some nostalgia to it, but people say, oh, it's not that great a story. It's just like something they did, and then Superman came back, or whatever. Return of Superman and the entire series with the Superman and the reign of the Superman is where we get the 90s schlock like uh, things about this event that people dislike. I am a fan of this, but I'm a fan of it in a way that like is extremely nostalgic and is not based on the quality of the book at all because I don't think that the writing here is that good. I think that it does a lot and is very ambitious but ends up falling pretty flat in the long run. So what I mean when I say that it set an interesting precedent for what would happen in big events and comics going forward, I mean this. Uh, when Gwen Stacy died, which I use as that example because that's the first death that came to mind that was like a big permanent death that had a big effect on comics publishing. Uh, it was something that happened. And then the story of Spider-Man continues. And obviously that event had ramifications for the story, but it didn't uh, change the book inherently. Like Gwen Stacy dying just meant that like, now there would be other love interests for Peter Parker in the future. It was a very sad thing for him, was something for him to process and work through. But the death of Superman does something a little bit interesting, which I, I think first of all, the most important thing that it does is by killing the central character of the book, it requires new characters to appear to fill that void. So technically, yes, uh, Mary Jane Watson appearing to kind of replace, not replace, but generally replace a Gwen Stacy type role in Peter's life when she was first introduced. Um, that made sense, but it wasn't totally necessary. He could have been, you know, single and without any prospects for a very long time. But Superman dying means that there must be a replacement. We're going to replace Superman with this new character, or in this case, new characters. There's a lot of new Supermen. Uh, but secondly, Superman coming back from the dead, people knew what happened as soon as the event happened, right? It's like th there's no world where Superman actually just dies forever. So it's going to be how is he going to come back? Also, feel free, you know, go off in the comments if I'm wrong about that. Maybe everyone did believe at the time that Superman was never going to come back. But I think if you were not a kid, if you were like someone who was a teenager or older, you would know that the business requires Superman to come back from the dead. And the precedent that I think that set is to say that like now anybody, any big character can die with no ramifications. And and in the past, this has happened, right? Jean Grey obviously dies over and over in comics. And there's all these you know ways at the Phoenix Force and they bring her back and people die and then they come back, whatever. But the central main big character of the biggest book on the planet, like it's Superman. He is superheroes dying and then coming back, uh, I think set this very interesting and kind of dangerous precedent in terms of writing that like now if like 
Spider-Man gets shot in the face and die. Like, you know, I mean, it happened not that long after. And I mean, obviously, yeah, it was maybe 10 years or whatever. But like in 2006, 2007, Captain America like dies at the end of Civil War. Like he gets shot. And then you have like the the that little one shot where Iron Man goes and like visits his grave. And it's a good little vignette and it's a nice story. But it's like, but Captain America's not going to stay dead. That felt like a shock value cheap death that we know is going to be undone. But now that it had happened with Superman in 93, it's like it can happen to anyone. There is no one in comics that is going to be permanently dead, for one thing. But secondly, there's no one that's like not going to die because they're such a big character. It's like, well, actually, we can just make money by cheapening that out and selling like the death of Iron Man and just make a huge deal out of a book where a big character dies. I know that characters had died and come back before in comic books. I'm not saying this was the first time it happened, but I'm saying that the reign of the Superman and how long they let Superman stay dead for and bringing him back and making this big thing and then Superman just walks back into the world set this precedent that like the biggest superheroes can die and come back and so if you're interested in superman and, and you want to get into it i don't think death is the place to start obviously i think you want to read some of the other good stuff i always uh, point to all-star superman that's like the thing because i think that as a new reader you can jump into that having no knowledge of superman and you'll get a really great experience but there's a lot of good superman stories to read next up we're going to talk about my all-time favorite superhero uh which i probably have said before on this channel about other people because i use a lot of superlatives when i talk unfortunately but really since I was a young child um, even before I was into Batman like before I understood what I liked about superheroes my man Moon Knight was my favorite and he always has been I am very proud to say that I bought a copy of Moon Knight issue one for six dollars when I was like 10 years old at an antique store and now you know he is a character that people know and love and I was way ahead of the curve on that so I need to get my get my due in the fan circles of course because being a nerd like this is very competitive so this is Moon Knight by Brian Michael Bendis. Um, I think it's really fascinating that Moon Knight has not had that many comic books written about him. There are obviously a uh, th there are obviously a decent amount of Moon Knight runs out there, uh, but truly, like this is not this is not Iron Man, this is not Batman, this is not Superman, this is not somebody who like you have years and decades and decades of non-stop history. Moon Knight will just stop existing for a while. And and to be a Moon Knight fan in 2024 or 2025 into the future, right, we're living in like the, the most rapid and in intense uh, growth of Moon Knight content ever. And it's a great time to be a fan, um, at least for me. I think for many people, there's some disappointment in the ways the character has been handled, but uh, that's mostly to do with the TV show and the fact that like once something becomes popular, inherently all the really pretentious people are going to get weird about it. Uh, but I, as a Moon Knight fan, you know, I'm thrilled about it. I think that, like, he is such an interesting and complex character and has many of those qualities that we don't get in some characters that have some of the other arbitrary external characteristics of Moon Knight, like Rich or Martial Arts or whatever else, right? Like, Moon Knight has some more complexity to him, and I like that a lot. And Moon Knight is also a character that has incredible highs and incredible lows. And that, I think, is an interesting aspect to his uh, career as a superhero, right? He has creative highs, creative lows, places where people knew what to do with him and then places where people did not know what to do with him. Uh, I will always say that some of the best, if not the best ever, uh, Moon Knight art is the Bill Sienkiewicz covers from the original run. I think that stuff is phenomenal. It's beautiful. It's haunting. It's cool. It's got all, it's this really neat aesthetic. And I think that that in many ways is what makes Moon Knight cool is simplifying it, making it very iconic and simplified. Um, and that's why I like Jeff Lemire's run so much. I'll obviously sing the praises of Jeff Lemire's Moon Knight till the day I die, right? I don't think I'll ever stop talking about that, which people in my life want me to, but you know, and this here is one that I consider a creative low for Moon Knight. Um, I read this when I was probably 14 or 15. I checked it out from the library and I've since reread it. And um, it has an, what, what I would consider an interesting premise for a character that isn't Moon Knight. And the premise here is that uh, Moon Knight has within him the personalities of a few other superheroes during this run. Captain America, Wolverine, and Spider-Man, as well as obviously his Moon Knight uh, persona and personality. I think there's two reasons that this breaks down. One, um, centrally, Moon Knight having dissociative identity disorder uh, is fun, is like treated as a story gimmick rather than adding like humanity and kind of a tragic element to his character. And that's an artistic choice. I would never begrudge it to Brian Michael Bendis and say like you are obligated to tell your story in this way. But I do feel that if you're going to present a character who has a 
well-documented history of a mental disorder that you would then respect that there are like real world implications to that and just kind of plugging in characters to uh mark's brain in this book and saying like because he has did now he can just be captain america and i know there are story contrivances that allow captain america to be one of those personalities right but now he can just be the wolverine i I don't feel that that's um a compelling way to portray mark's mental condition and so that's kind of an odd aspect to it. Um, another odd aspect to this, though, is that I don't feel the story uses the fact that he has those personalities in his brain effectively. Um, to me, the most compelling thing about this has always been Mark figuring out how to have the powers of each of the the characters. And I wish, really, truly, that most of this book was spent uh, selling us on the idea that Mark could come up with a way to duplicate powers. He does this in the book, but I, I really feel that like it cheapens those other characters to say like Spider-Man could be duplicated completely by uh, Moon Knight very quickly. All of Captain America could be duplicated very quickly. What you're setting up is that like Mark Spector is Taskmaster, I think is what we're kind of getting at here. And Taskmaster is already a character. Um, so there's there's just less there that like compels me to believe that it's it's super interesting. It just feels like, what if this happened? And then even though the things that would be required for that to happen have not happened, uh, Mark does not spend an enormous amount of time developing the physical characteristics necessary to be these characters. He just can and, and does it, you know? He comes up with a way to have claws and then just has claws and there's none of that that like ironing out and I wish that was more the case Um, and then my final critique of this is I think that like I would so much rather see Mark Spector just team up with these characters like rather than say that he has to like have web shooters because he has Spider-Man in his brain it's like give us a four character team up book and make it that the dynamic is tough because these are four different characters putting them in mark's head i don't think uh benefits us too much i I think what you could do if you wanted that element of mystery right is allow for some sort of like uh teenage mutant ninja turtles the last ronin element where uh you know the the voices and the appearance of these characters is maybe a little bit hallucinatory maybe there are extra things going on but then like in the end, there is some sort of reason and, like, rationale for those characters appearing there. Um, and I just, I don't know, I, I just, I feel like this is not the execution of the idea to the proper extent. And and part of that could be that I think Moon Knight is such a profound and cool character and someone that I really like reading books about and, and starring, so maybe my bar is just too high on this, but I do feel that, like, this could have been done a lot better. Now we get to talk about my real pet peeve. I don't like to be ov- like aggressively critical about comics, uh, but there are a couple that I do. Watchmen is the greatest thing ever made a- 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 as a comic book, the greatest graphic novel, the greatest superhero story, all that stuff. Nobody can argue whether or not Watchmen is the best. It just is. It's one of those odd things in the history of literature where everyone agrees it's the best and it actually is. There's not a lot of competition there. And that's what makes this book so disgraceful, of course. I'm talking about Doomsday Clock. I mean, come on. I don't think Jeff Johns is an objectively always bad writer. I I truly don't. Um, After seeing the Flash movie last year, I went and read Flashpoint, which I had never read. And I was really, I mean, perhaps because I had the contrast of the movie and I, I had just seen, but I was really impressed with Flashpoint and how like everything that's bad in the movie is like better and makes more sense in the book and it's done better, right? And the fact that, you know, the movie is trying to be a direct adaptation in like a very faithful way, but instead really misses the essence of what makes Flashpoint good. I think it's like, okay, that's a testament to Jeff Johns, right? That like he wrote something that when they tried to adapt it and they did a bad job, the book still reads well. I think that's great. Um, I like Three Jokers. I'm not a Three Jokers hater. I think a lot of people are. I like Three Jokers. I think that's a very compelling premise. And I think he does something interesting with it. Like, it does both where like for a moment in three jokers you actually think that there it's fully three and that it's this very interesting thing about the the history of gotham and then it's like okay he kind of wraps it up in a way that allows the the rest of the stories we've ever seen with the joker to also exist and that like it doesn't require you to believe there are three jokers that's cool um this book sucks doomsday clock sucks it to me is like such a hacky way to resurrect the watchman characters first of all because Watchmen, I feel at its core, is like 
is like almost satirical, right? Like you don't get a character like Rorschach without having his counterparts in the big publisher's catalog of characters that he is making fun of. I don't think you get Ozymandias without Superman. So then to have them interact, to have them in the same book, that's dumb already. Like I'm already kind of like not on board because I just don't think that that's a compelling story to tell, to say like, what if the characters that these people are making fun of met the character I don't I I think that's dumb and I don't like it so that's part of my criticism of Doomsday Clock the other part of my criticism is that just like it doesn't need to exist even if you had a pitch for a Watchmen sequel that was so good I, I would pretty much always say like just don't do it <laughs> um there's not people out here really 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 clamoring for like another Lord of the Rings book that takes exactly where the first one ended and just picks it up and keeps going because it's like well that's the Lord of the Rings like it's done not only is the author dead so like don't disrespect his legacy but also like Jeff Johns is, is not Alan Moore like we're we're dealing here with someone saying that they deserve the title of the successor to Alan Moore and writing a sequel to his book and and because we know that this book exists only because Alan Moore had the rights like stripped from him to, from Watchmen like it, it feels so much like a money grab and it just it just sucks i think my bookmark might still be in this that i was like i was like 75 percent of the way done when i gave up because it's just so boring it doesn't feel interesting compelling like it, it's just I, I don't know i i, I dislike the supermanification of watchmen which is like at its core an anti-superhero sentiment book that like not only does it does it de decry the evils of big above humanity superheroes it also talks about like street level people i don't think you get rorschach without daredevil or you know characters like that at that street level where like alan moore is poking fun at tropes that exist at the highest and lowest levels of comic book storytelling and so then to to take characters and be like let's put our cheery you know metropolis superheroes into this and try to make them more grounded it's i don't i don't like that if you want an example of something that i think does really well the contrast of like oh what if we took like the bright and shiny justice league and then we put them in like a situation where it was these were these more like dark you know versions of them you have a really good version of that that like grant morrison and frank quietly did jla earth 2 and i just read that and, and i really liked it and it's where we get that meme panel that's been going around it's like open the window luther i liked that a lot and i felt like anything that does is what doomsday clock is trying to do into being like oh what if there was you know they went to this other universe and they had all these interactions with their parallels and it was so f interesting and like kind of funny because look they're meeting each other it's all stupid it's all dumb i don't like it it's so boring and it's not tense it's not like watchmen where you're like edge of your seat where you're like oh wow like the world is gonna end you know there's none of that it's just like well it's superman and wonder woman are around like whatever i it to me it was just i felt like it was dumb i didn't like it i would feel the same way if you took like omni man and had him fight superman from you know uh, injustice or whatever where it's like they're they're the same thing like they're they're making fun of each other right like the the bad superman trope or whatever having homelander fight superman is a much better example i think than than what i said before homelander fighting superman defeats the point of both of those characters existing there's no it's like one is a satire of the other it exists to remind us how like this thing that we've pedestaled as the greatest character is actually like there are faults and quirks and interesting dumb things about him so putting them all in the same book in doomsday clock i think is stupid i don't like it uh i think it's boring and i think that there's no point in reading it like if you've just read watchmen don't pick this up right after it could tarnish your perception of how great watchmen is next up you know him you love him actually you probably don't if you're new to comic books this is not a name you hear a lot because his time in the spotlight came and went and now you don't really hear people talk about him because they're aware that he's not worth reading. I'm talking, of course, about Dave Sim and Cerebus. I think that Cerebus is a, a fascinating example of a problem that still exists in comic books, an impossible catch-22 of publishing. The impossible catch-22 of publishing is that on one hand, artistic freedom and ownership of what you create is critical. One of the most important things, we've seen this time and time and time and time again, that artists die desolate and broke because they are not compensated for and they're not credited for the work they do in creating characters. 
My personal vendetta against Marvel Comics has been and always will be Jim Starlin for creating Thanos, as well as like Drax and a million other cosmic characters that are being used in movies and selling literally more tickets than any movie in history, and yet Jim Starlin is doing like $5 signatures at Comic Cons. They're lucky if they get, you know, a credit in the end credits of the movie at the very bottom. It's like acknowledgments to da 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 da. And then nothing happens. They don't get any kickback. They're not compensated at all for creating a character. I think that's disgusting. And so in a dream world, right, I think Jim Starlin gets to have Thanos. And so all the books he wants to write with that character, he gets to. And I know that, like, you can have free reign publishing at a publisher. He, he could go work for Marvel and maybe they would give him the reins to Thanos. That's cool. But... I'm talking about like ownership of what you create. One of the biggest champions of that has always been Todd McFarlane, except for that time with Neil Gaiman. But hey, as of a couple weeks ago, now we know it doesn't really matter if Neil Gaiman was on the right side of that fight because he's a terrible, disgusting, horrible person. So I think it all kind of evens out in the end. So while creator owned and independent publishing is like one, one of the most critical things and, and credit for your work and being able to own what you make, that is so important. On the other hand, uh, many things happen in their best form because of editorial decisions made by teams of basically marketing people and bosses and structures and corporate engines. So a great example of that is the Secret Wars event from the 80s. I hate to say it, but like that was a monumental thing. And it was designed because of selling toys. Like it was made to say like, let's give kids a reason to put all their Marvel action figures in one place. And so then they'll want to buy more and they can all interact and we'll put them all on the same planet. And it turned out that we got like some of the most important pivotal moments in comics from the 80s in Marvel, at least from Secret Wars. I mean, Secret Wars number eight, that's up there on my wall right there. Right. We don't get anything that happens with Spider-Man with a black suit on without Secret Wars. I think that's really cool. And I think that amid the chaos, there comes a costume is like one of the coldest, coolest lines that's ever been put on the cover of a comic book. So I'll always love Secret Wars for that reason, even though it is inherently a corporately designed product. And then, of course, like many of the characters that we know and love, their stories originate from people that are in-house writers who take a chance and they're able to take that chance because they have the funding and support of a large company to be able to say, hey, what if we make this character who looks like this and has this power and it's whatever, whatever, and then it becomes an unexpected hit. I think that's cool. It's nice to be able to have room for experimentation at a publishing place because uh, they have the money to have experiments that fail, right? So then I think that the dream is that if you have an independent character that you've created or a story or a book or whatever, you need an editorial team. You need people around that will tell you when you're making bad decisions. And if you don't, you get Cerebus. Now, I only have volume one of this uh, and volume one is before it really goes off the rails. <laughs> But Dave Sim is known as the guy who made this book that had the longest running stretch of independent creator owned comic books ever until Spawn broke that record. But he ended up using it as like a personal hateful journal by the end. Like by the time he got far enough into this series, there were just written pages of him kind of self inserting into the story and talking about his personal opinions. And these are things that like, if there were a proper editorial team at a major publisher that had to sell books, never would have been allowed to happen because they would not have been able to publish that stuff. But because he is in charge of it and is the final word, it's like, well, it's going to go out because Dave is the guy, you know, he's in charge of it. And so I think that if you are interested in independent comics and like getting into the world of that stuff and knowing what's out there outside of the big publishers, there are a lot of options for you. And you can start with even a, a slightly smaller publisher like Image or Vertigo or Boom or any of those. But just going right to something like this is going to be a bad decision, even though when you look up like, oh, what are some big independent comic books, you will hear about Cerebus. I mean, issue 10 of Spawn is the cover that has Cerebus on it. And that's, you know, a pivotal part of the story for Spawn and like intersecting with other creator owned comics. But yeah, I mean, you can very easily avoid this and avoid reading a lot of really gross stuff by the time you get to the end of the story. Plus, I've joked about this to people before, but if you want like the aesthetic of Cerebus, uh, to some extent, it's not an exact match, but just read Bone. Like that's much better. I like Bone. And it's got that similar thing of like really highly stylized and, and silly looking characters in like very realistic environments having real grandiose adventures. Um, and I think that's funny. So you can feel free to do that and, and just find other things that have this same vibe without feeling like you have to dig into this creator own independent book because it's not going to gain you much. It's kind of like watching Game of Thrones for the first time in 2024. It's like, you know, it's going to end really badly. Why waste the time? 
Okay, the last two that I want to talk about, I don't actually own, which is a little bit shameful of me to admit, but there's two books that if you're a comics fan and you're getting into comics, people are going to tell you not to read, and I'm going to also tell you not to read them. One of them, I do think you should eventually read. The other one, I don't think is ever worth reading at all. These are two Spider-Man stories. The first is The Clone Saga, and the second is One More Day. The Clone Saga is the one that I think you should eventually read. Um, I think once you have a firm grasp on Spider-Man and a lot of the stories that shape his character and who he is, I think The Clone Saga is a good read because it helps you kind of set up the ways that editorial has made bad decisions over the years with Spider-Man. It helps you understand that like it's not all hits. It's a lot of misses in there, and yet good things can come out of it. I like Ben Riley as a character. I find him very compelling. He also serves a very important story role for many, many years in allowing us to have a, an unattached Spider-Man, a Peter Parker stand-in who can do whatever he wants, and we don't have to deal with a lot of the other aspects of Peter Parker's life if they don't want to tell those parts of the story. If they don't want Mary Jane there, it's like, well, this is a Ben Riley story, but fundamentally, they're the same person. We just get to have an adventure with Ben Riley, right? I think The Scarlet Spider is very cool. I have some of his books. I have some greatest stuff up on my shelf and whatever. And so the Clone Saga, it's like eventually worth reading. But in the moment, while reading it, like I, I read it as a kid and I didn't have a lot of context for it. And I was really, really disappointed and really upset because once it starts and gives you this premise that there's a clone of Spider-Man, you might think that like, oh, that's interesting. There's going to be some really cool stuff in here about like, who's the clone? Who's the real one? Whatever. Well, what ends up happening very quickly is that the editorial and writing team did not know how to resolve that. And so you just get this really rambling, really long story that just kind of fizzles out. I mean, pun intended for Spider-Man. It just peters out over the course of its entire run. And there's no like clean end in sight. There's not a moment where you feel like, oh, this is why there's a story about a Spider-Man clone. It's just like, and then eventually the story ends and the clone walks away. And I, I, Tim, it's a very unsatisfactory. And there are much tighter stories you can read with Spider-Man that will give you like a beginning, middle, and end. If you want a Spider-Man story when you first start reading Spider-Man comics that's like modern and has an interesting premise and yet is not just like Spider-Man swinging through the city. If you want something unique, something that has an edge to it, read Superior Spider-Man. That's a fantastic story about Dr. Octopus gaining access to, to Peter Parker's body and becoming him and taking over his mind. And, you know, switching it's switching brains with him. That's the, the central premise there. And that's a really interesting premise, but it's actually one that's delivered on. And that's because, obviously, Dan Slott is, like, one of the best Spider-Man writers that's ever lived. And so he's very capable to do that. The other one, though, and the one that I, I don't even... I don't own, because I don't think it's worth reading, is One More Day. Um, everyone will tell you not to read this, and they're right. It, the way that Watchmen, everyone will tell you to read first, and I will tell you to read first, and it is also objectively the best... One More Day is a thing everyone will say to avoid and that sucks and they're right and you should avoid it and it does suck. Uh, uh, One More Day is horrible. It's it's uh, it's it betrays everything about the Spider-Man character. So it sets up a premise that says what if Peter Parker did something that he would fundamentally never do. And when you initially come up with that idea, I think that there's like a decision point as a writer you could make where you could say wouldn't it be interesting to present a new option for Peter Parker, a new option for Spider-Man where he does something he's never done before? Uh, but whenever you say, and that thing should be, you know, make a deal with the devil to change history to make his life easier. I think you have already misunderstood who Spider-Man is. You've already, there's already been a breakdown in what he represents, why he does the things he does. And so if you pursue it from there, that's your fault. Like, it's it's the reason the story is bad is not because it's badly written it's actually because it should not have been written at all it's like the premise is flawed there's nothing in it that demands to be told and so i think that's the reason that one more day doesn't work um and i hope that you know we never live in a world where it gets adapted i will say it's funny because there are elements of spider-man no way home that loosely could be that right like there's all these ideas of like uh, making a deal with some some super powerful deity to reverse something historical, but in No Way Home, even you know, No Way Home is like a, a decently written movie. Uh, even that does a better job of holding true to Peter Parker's character and who he is than One More Day, and that's crazy because that's written by a team of Hollywood writers, not comic book writers, right? They may not have a hundred percent of the context on Spider Man, but they definitely are able to know that like hey, if we're going to do this, he has to do it for the right reasons that Peter Parker would actually do things. And so that's a, um, 
a hilarious thing to me that One More Day has not been adapted, but in the in the tiny ways that it has, it's been done better every single time. So One More Day, it's horrible. Don't read it, but do read the Clone Saga. Eventually, get around to that, I say, as a, as a Spider-Man fan. Right there, guys, I'm going to say, that's the stuff that you don't want to read. Uh, or if you do want to read it, just give it some time, get more familiar with stuff, and then, you know, you can circle back, you can read it. But don't jump into it head first. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.